Welcome to the Empowered Essence Podcast, where we liberate you and empower you to let your soul lead the way in life and business. I am your host, Laura Lawrence, sharing my thoughts and intimate conversations with featured guests on human design, energetics, and spirituality to provide you with the tools you need to tap into your most authentic self. I am here to empower you to walk away feeling ready to live your most expansive and purposeful life. Let's dive in. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Empowered Essence. I'm really excited about this conversation today because it's something that I'm just very curious about in terms of learning more. I've seen it more and more pop up on social media, friends talking about this, but um, it's just something that's just caught my attention and I'm just curious to learn a lot more. So today we've got Julie Hagen with us. And she is a lawyer turned microdosing expert. So it is so cool. And I'm so excited to dive into your background. But before we before we dive into that, I just wanted to share. So I met Julie online um, through a common acquaintance. And I had heard this other person talk about her and I just got intrigued and followed her and joined her masterclass uh, the other week. And so Julie led us through in her masterclass, a breathwork session, and I've never done breathwork before. And it was game changing. It literally, it was like this experience that I've never experienced before where I just like became so in my body and felt this like power coursing through my body. That, that's the best way that I could explain it. It was like this energy vibrating through my body as I was like just breathing, which makes me so fascinated by the fact that our bodies, like just by doing some very basic functions, like breathing can get us to like tap into our inner knowings, our power, our purpose and, and our energy. So I think that breath work is just so cool. Um, but without further ado, that's just some background. And, and she actually reached. And so during this session, I was thinking to myself, I was like, I've got to have her on this podcast, but she actually reached out to me a couple of days after the masterclass and said, Hey, Laura, like, I'm really interested in human design. I'd love to be on your podcast. So it was just very serendipitous that we were both thinking of each other. And I'm just so excited to have you on the podcast today. So without further ado, welcome Julie to the podcast. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I really appreciate that you reached out after the breathwork session and just shared what had come up for you because yeah, it, it's interesting, right? Like we're online. So maybe for us, it's a little easier to like make a connection and sort of open up. But when people share, it's really, um, I wouldn't say validating, but like it helps fuel my work. It's like, it, it's like sign from the universe to me. Like that's my um, invitation to keep going, right? To think like this work is helping people. Like I need to stick with it because, you know, as business owners, like business isn't always like easy or free flowing, but it can feel really good when you know you help someone. Yeah. Yeah. I call them earth angels. It's like these, these people that come into our life that share these profound insights after having worked with you. And it's, it is that confirmation. It's that validation that, Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm on the right path. So I'm so glad I could be that for you. I know I've, I've had a few of those along the way as well. And, and it's definitely something that makes you smile. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to be here and talk. Um, I think we both have such um, powerful modalities in our business and both of them are really like things people become more and more interested in. Right. Cause I remember like growing up, I of course like knew my astrology like at least in a basic way right but like human design was something I discovered later and it's I think there's two really powerful things that are coming forth to support people in like a new evolution and expansion yeah yeah I truly believe that whatever modality it is that you're introduced at a particular point in time like you were meant to discover it at that time and like human design came into my life at that exact right time and I'm sure microdosing came into your life at the exact right time so I can't wait to dive into that so I would love for you to give a little bit of background on yourself um, your journey and and just for the audience to get to know you a little bit better well, cool. um, thank you. Well, I used to start my story when I first started coaching when I was a lawyer, um, but I think actually now it makes a little bit more sense to go a little bit further back and come really full circle in this. But 
when I started uh, undergrad, I really thought that I wanted to be a doctor and I was very interested in like um, neuroscience. So really what I wanted to do was like get a PhD in neuroscience and go do research. Um, but I was obsessed with like philosophies, so, like Plato, the cave and the black box, like where does consciousness come from? Um, like that sort of theoretical side of it and, and psychology. Ultimately, blood really scared me away from the field. And I was kind of like, what am I going to do with this? Like neuroscience, philosophy, psychology degree it was really cool. It's a, a unique degree to my university. It was called PNP, but um in a very practical way, I sat down and made a pros and cons list of what I was good at and what I liked. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll be a lawyer now. <laughs> um, so I took the LSAT, became a lawyer, and I love, I love the higher level thinking and concepts that go into the law. I'm very like intrigued by that in the same way that I was intrigued by this idea of consciousness. Um, and I stay abreast of the law and I practiced for four years in corporate law, but ultimately it just wasn't my passion. And I felt very disconnected from myself in that experience. And I was very, very anxious, like is probably the best overall word to, to describe it. I just, I experienced a lot of ruminations, like unable to let go of thoughts. And in my ruminations, I would always choose like worst case scenario thoughts. Like literally I called them apocalyptic thinking. Um, I was very disconnected from my body. I'd realized I lost my dad at a young age, and I realized while I was still practicing that I experienced intense dis I experienced intense dissociation from my body, um, as like a trauma response, right? And so I was like really unraveling all these things, and I kind of on a whim. I don't want to say it was like on a whim, on a whim, because if the, like the pandemic had it have happened, things would have turned out a little bit differently with my trajectory and like the firm I was going to work for here in California. But I quit my job in um, Illinois and moved to California. And I dove really deep into personal development because I knew like, I just didn't like who I was being ultimately. Um, and from there, I was like, I can do this. Like I could coach people come to me for advice. So I got certified in regular, just like success in life coaching, loved it. But I had sort of a hard time like translating this work into something that was like super approachable for everyone because I tended to work with like entrepreneurs and higher level business owners just like from my corporate background um but I knew like there was some way I could serve more people and then I reached sort of a personal plateau in my own growth and I've always been a bit of a psychonaut in a more recreational sense and I was like no you can do this in a beautiful like intention I was always very intentional with my with my um psychedelic use like it was for my own healing and I would take myself through journeys and it wasn't like a, a crazy, like rampage party fuel thing, but it was like, I didn't necessarily have the skills behind it. I had coaching. So like that, that definitely supported me, but I got interested in like trip sitting. So now I'm a trip sitter and I can take people through larger journeys, but I was interested in like, how can I maximize the benefits of this practice on a daily basis? Because obviously you can't, you know, <laughs> go on a journey every single day found microdosing, researched it, began taking classes, created a whole program that supports the positive effects in your brain with microdosing. And like, here we are. It's something that like so many people are loving and using. And honestly, almost everyone can benefit from the practice of microdosing. There are some groups that just really shouldn't and for whom it would not be supportive. But like, just the amount of people that have had amazing results through this work makes me so happy. Yeah, that is, that is so cool. Your journey. Um, what I love about what you said at the very beginning, how you really like gravitated towards like more of that, like neuroscience piece. I can totally relate to that. So when I was in university, I did my business degree, but my favorite courses in university were psychology. I loved understanding people. I loved understanding why they are the way that they are. So it's really interesting that something that you were just so naturally passionate about, passionate about and gravitated towards is actually where you're ended up now, which is very similar to me. Although I'm not a psychologist, it's, it's, I, I I've always uh, loved understanding people and then the way that they think and what they do. So that's, that is so cool. So tell us more about microdosing, because I think a lot of people can be like, 
oh my gosh, like you're doing psychedelics, like that's not safe or there, what are the implications of it? So can you just tell people what is microdosing and, and why is it different than going on a journey or a trip? Um, that's such a great question. And I think it's really important at the beginning of the question to say that microdosing simply means taking a small amount of a substance, um, small enough that you don't necessarily feel the same effects that are associated with the substance. So you could microdose a lot of things, right? Like you could microdose um, LSD, cannabis, or psilocybin. I facilitate with psilocybin or magic mushrooms. Um, and it's a fraction of a normal dose that would result in a trip. So microdosing inherently means there is no trip. And really, if you quote unquote, feel something, you're not technically taking a microdose. So there are different people in the field and they recommend different protocols, but the protocol I follow calls for like the smallest amount possible because yeah, in my mind, when you're taking those, you know, even a few grams more or sorry, milligrams more, you start to experience not hallucinations, but you can kind of notice something in a way that is more profound. And that to me is not a microdose, right? Like a microdose should be a very subtle um, change in affect. So there are kind of two ways to process it. And I, for, I, I found like with working with my clients, some people either feel like they took a cup, of, they had a cup of coffee, like a nice, you know, yummy cup of coffee and they have more energy, but it's like a clear sort of energy. They're focused, um, you know, not jittery or on edge. They're emotionally available to the people around them. And it's sort of like, either way, it's always sort of like things just sort of roll off your back. So you get cut off in traffic. And instead of like saying, you know, F you, it's a, eh, they really must have needed to go somewhere. That's okay. Um, or the other type of experience that people tend to have is like, and this I've found for people who are already pretty versed in some sort of like bodily practice is like, it's almost like a, an ability to deepen into their body. So for people who already meditate, like you can sort of drop into that very powerful presence right away. And because it's such a small dose, because you're not feeling the effects, you can still get the positive results in your brain without feeling like you're out of control or, you know, you don't feel like yourself or anything else that people might've experienced with a trip. So if you've ever had a bad trip, I'm so sorry. I just want to let you know, like, that's not what microdosing is. And there's no way to have a bad trip um, on the protocol that I recommend and use in my program. And if you're someone out there who's scared of, of microdosing because it does involve psychedelics, I just want to assure you that there's no tripping involved, but there is, there are very powerful changes in your brain. If we could go into that. Yeah, I would love to know. So I, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking about questions that I wanted to ask you. So I, I definitely want to know, like, what are, what are the impacts to the brain? Cause I know, um, so my first line, I'm like diving into this. So when, when I first discovered it, I started Googling a lot. And, and, and so to understand like, what is, I've read a lot about how it changes your neural pathways, how it uh, improves your cognitive function. So like, how is that? Why is that? What's the, the science behind it? So there are three really core. I mean, there's a lot of science behind it. And I love, I love reading research papers. Like I know that probably sounds like what is wrong with this girl, but I really do. Um, I, I worked in labs in undergrad and, uh, but there's three really core concepts that I think people get to understand and hear in order to make, you know, more of an informed decision around this modality. And the first one is this idea of entropy, which is essentially just chaos in your brain. And I know that sounds bad, but for people who experience anxiety, depression, OCD, or PTSD, or who are looking to, you know, maybe get a boost of creativity, our brain tends to fire, you know, neurons that uh, wire together, fire together, or fire together, wire together. Um, and we tend to experience similar connections day after day after day. So, you know, in, in neurolinguistic programming in this modality that I have in coaching, I think it's like 90% of your thoughts are recycled day like day to day. So you only have this 10% window to make a change, right? So that's why sometimes changing your beliefs and changing your default um, thinking patterns is so hard because the way our brains currently work, it just, we default back to this old way of thinking. So for people with those um, experiences, I mentioned like anxiety and depression, what happens is we develop really, and I say we, cause I have had a lot of experience with anxiety, develop really deep ridges in our brain. So not only do we go toward worst case scenario thoughts and thoughts that are unsupportive. Um, but it becomes easier and easier to do that because it's almost like water creating like canyons. 
it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Like leave with the Grand Canyon. That's what's in our brain is like. Um, so when we increase entropy, we're allowing for new roads to come into our brain, right? For new pathways, for new ideas, to, yeah, innovation in all sorts of senses. And the ridges kind of get smoothed down. So those new neural pathways as a result of entropy is called neuroplasticity. We're creating new connections in our brain, but without the support of the tools, something like my program or other things, meditation, um, intentional rewiring, those new pathways aren't going to stick. Um, I just went on a date with someone. He goes, oh, so it's like taking steroids, but not going to the gym. And I was like, weird flex, but yes, like <laughs> that's basically what's happening. You're, you're take, or taking pre-workout, right? And not going to the gym. And, you know, you can't like, in the same way that steroids aren't a magic bullet to, um, you know, change your body. And I just want to be very clear that I had no way advocate for steroids. I just thought it was a funny example and a good, like a good, uh, you know, suggestion or not a suggestion, but a metaphor that he used. And yeah, so in the same way, like you really have to do the work to change things. That's why people who kind of microdose one off, they might say like to have a good day, but they don't really see any long lasting change. It's because they didn't do anything to make the new connection stick. But the coolest part about um, psychedelics in my mind and psilocybin is the effect it has on this thing called the default mode network in our brain. So the default mode network is a series of interconnected structures. And it's really where we find our ego, right? Um, those I statements, um, victimization, thinking about the conversation. It's like where you're in the shower and you're playing out the conversation and you're thinking, oh, I should have said blah, 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 blah. That's the default mode network. Um, and it's where we, you know, catastrophize about the future, ruminate about the past, all of this. So happiness research, I loved happiness research when I was in undergrad, tells us that happiness isn't money, cars, relationships. Happiness is presence fully embodied in the current moment that we were having. Happiness is mindfulness. So if we're in the default mode network where we spend 48% of our day, we're inherently not present, right? Because we're, we're somewhere else and we're very like self-thinking, self-centered. Um, so when we can quiet the DMN, we can shut the DMN down. We can go somewhere else. We can become present and then we're going to be more happy. So basically most people spend half their day not happy. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. So who would you like, who's a typical client that you work with? Um, like, do you work with entrepreneurs, mothers? Like, I just, I feel like my, where my brain is going is like, there's probably so many people that can benefit from this. Yeah. I mean, at this point I have so many, um, like client journeys. Cause when I first started, it was definitely people who were really anxious. Um, and who just like, didn't really feel good about themselves, weren't sure who they were, didn't feel like they were able to be like fully expressed, um, trying to get their lives together. Um, but yeah, I probably had spent some time just like not feeling like themselves anxious. And then I had a couple of clients, one client wanted to get off Adderall, like ADHD medication. Like she really didn't like the way it made her feel, but she didn't think she could focus. And she was interested in that. I've had clients with um, traumatic brain injuries. That was a really cool client. She is doing really well. She had been hit by a car. I have now I, I'm having mothers. I have two conversations with mothers today. Actually, that's kind of a new because there's so many fun articles lately about like moms microdosing. So I think mothers are finding their ways to me, their way to me more naturally. Also, I'm not a mom, but I'm sure it's really freaking hard to like be emotionally available to your child all day too. And just like take care of yourself. But I also have more and more entrepreneurs working with me who have their own and it's normally coaches, coaching businesses. And they're kind of like, I just feel stuck. Like something just doesn't feel like it's working. So I want to figure this out. Yeah, no, I love that. So like, um, how do you, how do you work with someone? So like, how do you determine what's right for them? Um, because obviously like, like my husband's a pharmacist, so he, you know, when you're prescribing something, it's based on their weight, their height. Like there's like, there's things that go into determining like the correct dosage of whatever medications. And I, I look at this in, in a, in a way like a medication in some respects, because you're just trying to give them like this little dose so that they're not, you know, going on a, uh, on a journey or a trip and, and it's just like perfect for them. So like, how, how do you determine that? How do you, like, how do you work with someone? Right. So there are so many different types of protocols. And I have found that the one that is the best is Stamets protocol. Um, Paul Stamets is like the father of, of mushrooms and his protocol 
does has so many things available in it, right? Like, so that can be creatively focused. It can be focused around easing anxiety um, and depression. So because it's so kind of like um, all encompassing, that's the one that I, I choose and I gravitate toward. And the other hand, like, you know, um, James Fadiman, and so Stamets protocol calls for the smallest dose possible, 0.1 grams. James Fadiman is really the father of microdosing. He's the one who coined this idea and started working with it. But his protocol calls for like 0.5 grams, which to me, that is not a microdose anymore. And like, I love him for bringing the practice in. Um, I've never met him personally, but I do like, I think that's an important conversation. And and he has had the conversation, but to me, that's just like, it's too much. So what I will say is that my, the protocol I work with in my program is so small that it is definitely okay for, for everyone, right? Like I'm not a very big person. You know, I've had clients that are like five feet tall and slender and like, it's totally okay. They don't have a, an ab reaction. Um, what I will say is when I first started doing this work, I have an ex-boyfriend who's also a business partner in a different area of my business. And he wanted to try microdosing and he's this big dude, right? He's six, four. And so I started him on Stamets protocol and it also worked for him and he didn't have to take more than like one capsule, which just says the 0.1 grams. But like theoretically, if I was working with a bigger person, we could talk about increasing it um, based on body weight to maybe 0.2 grams. But the 0.1 gram is always safe. And thus far, it's always been effective, no matter if you're like a, a larger person, like my big ex-boyfriend. So it's like we it works. It works for everyone. And it's it's also very low so that no one's going to trip. Yeah. So like how, so, so I'm assuming it's safe to go to work, to drive, to do all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's much less noticeable. Like, so for me, Benadryl really puts me in a weird spot. I get a little weird on Benadryl, but like, it's much safer than taking a Benadryl. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, I, I understand the, maybe some confusion or, or misconceptions around it totally, because, you know, unfortunately this has sort of become like a, there is like a counterculture narrative around it and there's like a party narrative around it, but it is so, so safe. You are completely safe to go about your day, to have conversations, to care for your children because you're not ever getting to the point of feeling like, oh, like I took something, right? Which is where you kind of are on Fadiman's protocol, which is like, to me, not the point. Mm -hmm. So I, the one thing that I wanted to go back to, um, it was something that you said earlier um, when you were introducing yourself is you talked about like how you weren't in your body a lot of the times. And, and a couple of minutes ago, you talked about how this like really helps you get into your body. So like, why can, can you explain to people like, why is it important to be in your body and what that means? Yeah. So what I found most interesting about like the mind body connection is that like trauma is stored two ways, right? Like it's not enough to do mindset work. And that's where I think like the coaching biz sometimes is like missing the mark because we can talk about our story and our trauma and we can heal it. And we can do the air process like in, in NLP and we can do all these things, but until we begin to like also heal our bodies and become present in our bodies, the trauma isn't actually gone. It, it's still there and it's still affecting us. So that's why people like, you know, can, can go to coaches, can go to therapists, but unless they're actually doing something that's integrating the healing in their bodies in a way that brings presence back, um, then it, it's not really effective. It's kind of not even really worth your time because you're just letting things ruminate and stick in your body. And so I once had a mentor tell me, um, body leads, mind follow. And it's so true. Like our bodies, are so intelligent. Our minds are also intelligent, but unfortunately, because of the way they come pre-wired, they're not always necessarily supportive and we get to be active in the rewiring process. But, you know, I'm always, and I, maybe this is also because I'm a splenic projector. I'm always most powerful when I can just take an inhale and an exhale and trust my body and the instinct that comes first, Mm -hmm. right? The first premonition from my intuition without like overanalyzing it. Your body is, is really smart. And that's where our innate intelligence is. And we get to come back into our bodies in order to follow that. So I found that like when I realized, oh my goodness, I dissociate hardcore. I was on this road trip. Thankfully, I wasn't driving. My friend was driving completely sober. And I had this experience where I was like, I felt like a little person in my body. And I was like seeing my life. Like I was not in control of the driver's seat at all. And I was like, what is 
happening to me. And it was, wasn't like a mental breakdown, but it was like this very overwhelming sensation of like, I don't belong in my body. Like my body isn't mine. I'm not here. What's happening? What is this life? <clears throat> and then I realized I can trace memories back in childhood after my dad died. We're like, I would just dissociate whenever I started to feel uncomfortable because that's how my my body and my mind kept me safe after this like very traumatic experience at such a young age. And so that's why when I found breath work, I was just so excited because it it, it makes your body feel good. Um, and I had a lot of body image issues. Like I ate for comfort after my dad died and like food was a weird thing for me. So it was just like a lot. It was a lot feeling like I don't like the way my body looks. I don't feel comfortable in my body. I'm not actually in my body. And so these somatic experiences have allowed me to really transmute that and to like, not only feel good about my body and to own my body and to care for my body, but like when I can like, when I get in a really good breathwork session or when I go to hot yoga and I'm so like connected and in the flow, I just like, that's when I feel my most amazing. Yeah. I, so I so relate to this. Um, so I would always disassociate from my body and, and this is, um, like, I think there's, it, it's not specific to any of the energy types in human design. I think anyone, regardless of your energy type can do that. But I think projectors, especially when we get into this like hustle mode. So I found in undergrad is probably when I noticed it the most, or at least when I became aware of what I was doing, because you're, you're forcing, you're hustling, you're pushing, you're doing things that are just so like against <laughs> what it is that you are here to do and here to bring to the world and how you're meant to operate. And so when we're doing these things, whether it's trauma or whether it's, um, you know, just how we go about our lives, we just disassociate with our body. And for me, like, and, and everyone, regardless of the modality for me, human design really allowed me to like tap back in to understand, okay, like my body is communicating to me at all points in time. And so I have, I have, I'm an emotional authority. So I I've got my emotions and like feeling my emotions. I would often just repress emotions and just like disassociate so that I don't feel it. But then I also have a defined spleen just like you. So it's like tapping into like, what is that? Like, instinctive, intuitive knowing and, and that feeling in our body. And so like generators and manifesting generators, it's that gut feeling. It's that, that gut knowing that what is right and what's wrong for you. And when I started tapping into that and knowing like how my body communicates to me, it was like, oh my gosh, like game over. Of course I want to be in my body. Of course I want to be able to feel this. Of course I want to sense this. And, and those emotions that we ride the waves that we ride or those, um, you know, getting over those traumatic experiences, those sorts of things, like we're meant to feel that in order to process it, in order to overcome it, in order to integrate it back into who we are and, and take the lessons and the learnings from, from each of those things. So I'm, I'm glad we, I'm glad you brought that up and chatted about that because I think it's just, so natural and whatever the modality is, whether it's breath work, human design, whatever it is, like they're just having that way to come back to our bodies because oftentimes, and also I'm, I don't know, do you, have you ever read, um, Carolyn Miss books? She's, she's, um, so she's really big into like energetics work and like the connection between energy and body. And so mm -hmm. I read one of her books, um, the anatomy of spirit, and that was also a game changer in terms of myself, like understanding how, you know, like when ideas and inspiration come in, it comes in through our head center and it filters through our body and it needs to ground itself into the ground before we can actually bring it to life or to manifest it. So like we get an idea for a program in our business. It's like you get the download and it's got to be able to like filter through your body. Yeah ground into the ground and then come back up in order for us to actually like take action and, and manifest in it, manifest it. And, um, so if you have like blocked energy centers or you're not in your body, it's really hard for those ideas and inspiration to actually come to fruition in the way that you desire them to. And, and so that was also another, <laughs> another turning point for me in terms of learning about like, yeah, like your body and how important it is. Um, in addition to like the spirit and the energetic side of things too. So, 
my cat just got so excited when you were talking to him. He was like, yes, definitely. Energetics. It's so funny because I think my cats are like energy, like animals for me, right? Like they really connect with my energy and like can read it. And we're also like interconnected or like a weird little <laughs> energy family. But it's true. It's I actually want to go on and I'm going to have another conversation after this, and particularly about energetics and business, because some people think it's such like a woo idea. But really, when your energy is dialed in like that's when everything happens like to me it's a very practical it makes sense in a practical scientific way Mm -hmm. um and some people just like disregard it but I think it's so important I know it's so important yeah well and so many like common things can impact your energy so for example like mothers it's like you're putting pressure on yourself to show up on social media when your kids are screaming in the background it's like well your energy is is chaotic it's sporadic is that the right time to to show up when you're feeling that way like um so energetics and like getting behind like what it is that you want to offer like there's like integrity behind that you know do you truly believe in your offers like there are things that that come into play that impact your energy at such a such a profound way that we don't always realize but they're just common things like Um, I I was talking to a client and she was so ticked off at her husband because he called her business a hobby. And I was like, do you think that impacts your energy? Of course it does. Let's, let's 